doing tonight? Y'all doing good? Did y'all feel the sweet presence of the Lord? Amen. Dude, that was good. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God's so good. God wants to heal you. You know that? I want you to know that. You might not even know you need healing. I see you over there, my brother. You can't hide from me. You might even know you need he- you might not even know you need healing. Amen. But look, he knows. He knows what we need, and he knows how to give it to us. Amen. Listen, I'm, I'm blessed. I feel like we're going to be blessed tonight. Just real quick, I, uh, you know, Mary and Cimarron started coming to the church. I don't know, what, about a month now or something, something like that. But I've been knowing Mary from way back. Me and Mary used to do ministry together at Cornerstone, and uh, we used to work with the youth, uh, youth ministry back in the day. And Mary has multiple gifts by the Lord. She's a musician. She 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 sings, and uh, but she's also a minister. And um, you know, as I was talking through, this is just give you an example of you know. Uh, I, I kind of just had asked her if she could, whenever she was ready, she could share her God story with us, amen? Like, and you know, y'all, we all got a God story, right? And listen, you're, you're, the story of how God has moved in your life is a very, very powerful thing. You need to understand that. Don't let the devil lie to you, and don't let the devil think, make you think you're insignificant. And because, listen, your, your God story is powerful. How God got a hold of you. And look, you might say, oh, but you don't know where I've been preaching. Look, look, the devil wants to talk about where you've been. I want to talk about where the Lord's bringing you. I want to talk about where the Lord's bringing you to, brothers and sisters. And listen, if we'll trust him and we'll believe God, he's going to do a healing in our heart and in our life. And he's going to do a work in our heart and in our life. Amen. Well, anyway. Uh, so I'd ask Mary to kind of share her God story. And, I mean, she's a preacher. I mean, and look, she probably ain't going to sound like me, thank God, because y'all can only handle so much of me. But nevertheless, she is a preacher, so I know it ain't just going to be her story. But, but you know, I, just to share with you a little bit what the Lord's already done. He's used her in many ways already, but this is one spot that I'll share. And I don't think that my brother or mine, but uh, we, we were having our little book club meeting one, not that long ago. Uh, we were talking about we were actually had transitioned from wherever we were and we had gone to the to this all hit me later first corinthians 13 which is the love chapter and we were talking about something having to do with the love of god and kind of like how god wants us whenever we minister to one another to minister to one another with a spirit of love does that make sense kind of like you know in other words if i'm if i'm going to treat if i'm having a conversation with bridget i'm going to try to have Bridget and, you know, prefer my sister over myself and try to treat her with love by the grace of God. And, and you do the same with me and I do it with Micah and I do it, you know, whatever. We're treating each other with the love and the compassion that Jesus had when he died for us and how he ministers to us. That's how the word of God teaches. So we're sitting here talking about all this stuff and all of a sudden, I'm just going to be real. It was Mike Landry. I've already apologized to him for it. And I hope you're okay with me sharing this because this is really a lot bigger than the situation with Mike Landers kind of showing you the inadequacies of my heart a little bit. So I was over there, and I, w- and I apologized already in front of the group that was here, but this is just an example of how the Lord used Mary in my life that night. So we're sitting there, and, and Mike said something. It was something that we had talked about before. It's not important what it was. It was something that we had talked about before, and it was like it was something that I'd already kind of like given him advice on, really kind of like multiple times about something. And 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 I was like, "Come on, dude! You know you can't, you know whatever." And I was kind of like cajoling him a little bit and kind of like you know pushing and whatnot. And and it'd probably been fine if it would have just been me and him in the parking lot. But it was kind of like at some point in time when I was doing whatever I was doing, I felt like the Holy Spirit started to kind of show me like. Later, when I thought about it, you're kind of starting to put him on blast a little bit. It's kind of getting a little bit awkward, you know, and the Holy Spirit was kind of dealing with me. And then all of a sudden, Mary had a scripture pulled up. And as soon as she started talking, I'm telling you, I'm not lying to you. The Holy Spirit says, okay, I'm over here. That's what the Holy Spirit started speaking to my heart. He, he said, I'm over here. Why don't you listen to this right here? So what he was telling me later on as I thought about it, I wasn't really in what you were doing at that moment, Matt. I'm over here. So why don't you divert your attention to this? And, dude, let me tell you, she gave a message, a little scripture out of, I think it was First Timothy. I can't remember. Whatever it was, and it was just so, it was so good at that moment. So anyway, 
Long story short, I just I, I asked Mary to come up and give her y'all do it. Let's, let's just give her our attention and and I believe that she's got a word from the Lord to share with us. Come up here, sister. Take your liberty. Amen. And be used of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. share without crying. I don't know about y'all, but it is true. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just thank you for everybody here tonight, Lord. It's all divine appointment. And God, I just ask for your anointing, because it's your anointing that breaks the yoke, Lord. So we just ask you, Jesus, anoint this word. And as Matt said, give us eyes to see, ears to hear. And Father, our heart to receive. Shoot. It's good right here? Right here? Okay. All right. In Ezekiel um, 3311. And like Matt was saying, you know, I've done a lot of street witnessing, I've dealt with a lot of people who have been away from God for a long time. Their hearts are hard. Um, you mentioned Jesus, and they literally lose it. But, uh, you know, God's a rest, restoration God and restores years that people go through hurts and pains in their life that, we don't know what a person goes through. We have no idea what people go through. I know personally myself, I've gone through a lot of things that almost killed me several times, emotionally, spiritually, um, physically. And uh, everybody, like Matt says, has a story. And we got to be uh, considerate of that when we share the word with other people. First thing we should be is compassionate and loving. And that's always been my motivation. But I ran into something within the church. And that's kind of what I'm going to share tonight. Not, not in a way of bitterness because I have forgiven everyone. <coughs> but I'm also going to share my personal testimony. And uh, I don't know what people know about me. I don't know. But I'm going to share that as I go along here. But in Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God don't take pleasure in people who die without him, is how I read this. But that the wicked turn from his way and he lives. Turn, turn from your evil ways. That scripture sticks with me every time I minister, that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He don't, he don't say, well, I, I told you so. You should have listened. He takes no pleasure in that. He grieves God's heart. It says, while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. We wasn't saved when we came to know the Lord. We was in sin. While we were yet in our sins, he died. He died for our condition. But if we know the word of God, there's a whole bunch of scriptures to the way the Lord looks at um, people who are lost and how he pleads for them. And it was always a turn away from sin, and it was always a turn to him. And it doesn't please God, I'll say it again, to lose anyone. Um, last week, I can't mention names here, but last week I was waited on by a person and I felt led to speak to them, but I ignored it. They're not here today. They died over the weekend. We're supposed to take every opportunity when the Lord lays something on our hearts like that, and I went to, we went out of town. I've been up since like 3 o'clock this morning with the rain and had an orthopedic doctor's appointment at 8 o'clock, and 
But we went to uh, Thibodeau, and we went into uh, the Lowe's. We had to pick up a couple of things before we came home. But uh, while I was in there, God reminded me of that. He said, what you going to do today? And everybody I came across, I said, how's you and Jesus doing today? How are you and Jesus doing today? And all the people that I talked to said, we're good. I said, you sure? They said, yes, ma'am. I said, you know. And I told them this very testimony that I was supposed to say something to somebody, and I didn't, and they passed away. And, um, but the Lord takes no pleasure in that. I don't know if they were saved. I don't know if they ever heard about Jesus. And that's, that's something we don't know. We don't even know how much people have heard. You know, we've been blessed. I was raised maybe not in a full gospel church, but I was blessed to know who God was. I was blessed to know that Jesus was the Son of God. But a lot of people, you'd be surprised, never heard it. But the Lord desires that no man perish and that everybody comes to repentance. Jesus said he didn't come to condemn the world, but he came to save it. And he went on to say, that we were already condemned when he found us. We were already guilty the day he found us. And he said that you didn't choose me, I chose you. What a good God, what a good God. But everybody, even on our best day, we've sinned. Everybody, everybody, none of us is, is uh, without some type of sin in our life. We were born in sin. If we never did anything horrible, like maybe I did, or anybody else, you know, I can't look at my grandmother and see me seek. I wonder, you know, what did you do, ever do wrong, Grandma? You know, I don't even know if she ever did anything wrong. But she was born as a sinner. Like, we all, we all got to be born again, the Bible says. Every one of us. In fact, the story she told me was really funny. I asked her one day if, she had ever heard about Jesus coming. And she said, yeah. She was really a Cajun lady. She said, yeah. She said, there was a man who came around, knocked on everybody's door, and he told us that Jesus was coming. And he said, we went to my friend's house. And she said, we waited for like three days, but he never came. <laughs> and so they took it literal, you know. I mean, she actually waited for Jesus, her and her friends. But she said he never came. Bless her heart. But Jesus, he didn't come to give us the payment that we deserve, but he offered us all the way out, right? Because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, it's eternal life through Jesus Christ. Anyone who has heard or read scripture should understand that there is a penalty for living a life of sin. And it starts to wear on you after a while. It really, you start to feel the penalty in this life. It'll wear you out. But he paid a debt, like the song says, that he did not owe. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing this brand new song, Amazing Grace, because Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. You probably think, well, we probably all know this. We've been in church. These are the basic principles of Christianity. So where am I going with this? It's going to get a little deeper. Romans 10, 13, it says, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Sometimes we get scared of telling people that scripture because we want them to be accountable. Not just call on the Lord. You've got to be accountable for your sin, right? So whoever calls on the name of the Lord, it says, shall be saved. We're not only to believe when we call on Jesus, but we also have to turn away from our sin that we've committed and live a life that's pleasing to God, 100%. There's a way we need to walk. He who is free from sin, it says, how can we live any longer therein, right? So this is where I'm going. My first round of coming to know Jesus was in 1986. And I did all these simple steps. I repented of my past. 
All my sins, I got them under the blood of Jesus. I let the word of God cleanse me. I got baptized in water. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I witnessed about my new life in Jesus to everybody I ran into just about. I was crazy for Jesus. I read the word. I didn't miss church. I didn't miss Sunday school. I was what they call faithful. Faithful to the house of God and to Jesus. And I was on fire for God. I'd found a new life. I spent eight years of my life in different ministries that Matt was talking about. I was in the choir. I did jail ministry. I did street ministries. Um, I became a pastor of a coffee house, which is an outreach ministry that I had. If anybody don't know what that is, it's when you stay open until the soul that Jesus sends you shows up. <laughs> and you minister to him or, or her, and God would send me all kinds of people. Sometimes 2 o'clock in the morning, I'd be sitting there waiting for that one person that God would send. And I did some tent revivals. I learned how to be a teen challenge teacher. I was married. I had a son. And I won't get into all the details, the things that caused me to walk away from all that. I never in my life thought I'd walk away from Jesus. Never in my life had I ever thought I would leave where I was at with Jesus. To do. There was a lot of hurt that I had to take unfairly. Things that I didn't even think would come to me in that way. It was unexpected. It was like a rug was just pulled out from underneath me. Like I was blindsided by Satan. But I can say that I was devastated. I'll say that when trust is broken between brothers and sisters in Christ, it's very hard to trust again. These are the people that know God. These are the people that you think, you believe that you can trust, that you can put your life in their hands, that you can trust them with your life, right? This is what I thought. But we all human. We all make mistakes. And I had... Just a broken heart. And um, I believe that what happened to me was a direct attack from the devil. I really do. I believe I was coming into a place of ministry. I believe that God was placing me, teaching me, showing me things. Uh, the Holy Spirit was really strong in my life at that time. This is when I fell away, y'all. <laughs> when God was the strongest in my life. But I believe what happened is he whispered into the ears of other people. And it brought me down. Scripture says that he's an accuser of the brethren. We don't talk about the devil much in church. I don't like to give him credit for much, but I know one thing. He's an accuser. And it's one thing we need to be aware of because he accuses us one to another. And he accuses us to God. And he does that for a purpose, to disunify a church to break them apart. When a church gets strong, that's the first thing he'll come in there and do is try to bust you apart. So while we've been all praying and asking God for revival, asking God to move, I guarantee you that little spirit's going to start talking in people's ears. Who she thinks she is up there talking? I know where you came from. I come from somewhere, and that's what we're going to get into. I'm not proud of where I went. But God takes our mess and turns it into a message, don't he? Amen. He does. But Scripture says that he is an accuser of the brethren, and he will accuse us to God and to one another day and night. He don't rest with that one. Day and night, it says. He never rests on that. It seems to be one of his favorite weapons in the church. I've seen it. 
Even coming back to Jesus, I've seen it. He was already waiting for me. He was waiting for me, y'all. That dude dead on rest. I was reminded of Job, how Satan went straight up to God, and he said that he can get Job. Job was a right man. He was right with God. But Satan had the nerve to go to God and said, I can make him curse you to your face. Just like that. Just walked up to God and said, I can make God curse you to your face. I mean, Job, curse you, God. So God said you can have him. Go ahead. But you can't have his life. Do what you want. <laughs> God allowed that, didn't he? I think that's kind of what happened to me. But I didn't recognize it. I didn't recognize what was hitting me like that. Anyway, Job, Satan was able to take everything from Job, from what he had, all he, all he owned, his cattle, his houses, everything he owned, his children, left him with a wife and a few friends that came back into his life after he got kicked in the pants and the rug got caught from underneath him. Here comes his fr uh, friends, Job's friends. They said, man, you must have done something, Job. You must have done something for all the things that have happened to you. And even his own wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? This is the nature of people without compassion. Okay? Some sometimes instead of being like Jesus, we assume things. We try to figure out what's wrong with you, Job. Man, you must have done something. God done tore up all your stuff, took your kids, busted up your houses, your, your cows, everything got blowed away. Your wife's telling you, just go ahead and curse God and die. You know, I wish I would have been more like Job where I just sat in that dust and ash with boils all over him. And he said, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. <laughs> but it takes a lot of strength to do that, man. I don't know how that dude did it. I don't know how he did it, but I feel, I feel Job's heart because in all that pain and all that hurt, hurting in his body, hurting for loss of his children, everything he got, had got blown away, his wife telling him to cuss God and die. Through all that, he said, if God slays me, I'm still going to praise him. Wow. Wow. Talk about a right man. But I just noticed his friends and how they treated him. And I was like, that is so, <laughs> I mean, how can you see your friend busted up, hurt, and ask him such a question? What did you, what did you do? You know, why didn't they just comfort him? Yeah. Why didn't they just sit next to him and say, I love you, my brother? You're going to get through this. This is the difference between assuming somebody might have done something against God, and that's why you're being punished. Then sitting with him and saying, God, comfort my brother, comfort my sister. Because yes, we're supposed to comfort other people in the ways that God has comforted us, yes. right? Give it back. Give it back. But that's the nature of people without compassion. God has always placed compassion in my heart. But he gave me such a big heart, it got busted up hard. Got busted up really bad. But sometimes instead, we need to be like Jesus and quit assuming things, trying to find out what happened. Have compassion. There was no encouragement. There was no restoration, only assumption and accusation. And I do. I wish I would have been as strong as Job and could have stand in that storm. But I wasn't. <laughs> And when I fell away from God, it was a time where the doors were just starting to open for me. I had favor. I was doing things that other people weren't able to do in the area. Things were moving. I had a good vision. I had places that I wanted to go with God. Then it was like a sudden destruction. And it was all taken away. Everything went south. And there was no recovering it. <laughs> But 20 years passed, 
20 years passed from that day. Three years ago, I just started serving the Lord with a whole heart again. Repented of my sins. Gave my life back to Jesus. But for me to recover, I had to start all over with God. And I also had to forgive, forgive all those who were ill-willed towards me. And, you know, when I started coming back trying to find a church, some of those people were put in my path. As I journeyed back to God, those people were put in my path to forgive them, and it was part of my healing. I literally, I felt like nauseous. I started thinking about going to church, and I said, oh, God, I ain't going back in there. Nope, I'm not going to do it. Because every time I would try to think of a church, which everybody in this area I know, which every church I had been to, uh, I didn't know where to go. Um, I knew they knew that I had fell away from God, and there was shame involved there too, you know. But I literally felt nauseous to walk back into a church setting. The anxiety of it all, I just always had a knot in my stomach. And again, I'm going somewhere with this. And here it comes. <laughs> it's not something I like to talk about. Because the Lord says, whom the Lord has cleansed, he's cleansed. There ain't no, uh, <laughs> God, when I walked away from church, I walked into a gay life, okay, straight up. I got divorced, the church divorced me basically. I felt abandoned. I could go on and on about so many things that led me there to that decision. But uh, bottom line, it was all my choice. I just chose to do it. I wasn't mad at God. I just was really disgusted with people to the point that I didn't care anymore, just didn't care. I hardened my heart, and I walked away from God. But I repented of my sin three years ago. And I've turned away from it. I have no desire for anything but Jesus. I vow to be celibate before the Lord. I love you too, man. Uh, because that's where I feel God wants me. Sexuality ain't all it's amounted to be. It gets you in a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. I think it's the strongest hold Satan can play on a person. But I've given it all to Jesus, and this is personal stuff. But we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and we don't love our life all the way to the death, right? Yes. So things that are hard to speak about minister to other people. Um, the Lord's delivered me. I'm free. I have no thought in that area of my life at all. Zero. I'm free. And for those who might wonder about my friend Cimarron, we're sisters in Christ. What the devil meant for evil, God has turned this around and made it good, okay? Now, you got a good pastor. He ain't scared to ask hard questions, all right? And I trust Matt, and I love Matt, and I love his wife. And Matt asks hard questions, and it's okay. Because you know what? I want to be transparent. I don't want y'all to think something's going on in my life that I shouldn't be on this pulpit. I shouldn't be sharing the word of God. Because this is a holy place. Amen. I have Anybody that gets behind this pulpit has a great accountability to God. Right. And it is accountability. You know, if I lead somebody astray... I'm in trouble. That's right. I'm in trouble. This is a place to be honest. One thing that kept happening when I was trying to find a church, now we're going to talk about the deal, the homosexuality. We're going to talk about it on a very low-key, respectful way because I'm going to tell you, these people can be saved. 
they can be saved. And the church has been hateful to them. And I understand why. Because there is a group that are very harsh towards church people. There's a group that is trying to force their way into children. They're trying to do things that are not right. I don't agree with that. I didn't agree with it when I was in the sin myself. I didn't agree with that. Um, a lot of it is, is pretty deep, and I won't get into that. But what I'm going to tell you is there, <clears throat> just like there's people who are straight, who still have hope, there are gay people who still have hope. Just like there's straight people who are reprobate, who hate God, who are in paganism, who are in the occult, who do all kind of other things, who will never turn to God, there are gay people who hate God. They will never turn to God. They don't want to. But there's a, there's a difference between, uh, it's okay to talk about this, am I? There's a difference between reprobate and still having hope. And I don't believe good people, like, you know, you can't, oh, she was a good gay person. I was. I mean, I'm still a good person no matter what people saw my sin. I still had a good heart and I still cared about people. And there was still a chance for me to receive Jesus because there was good still in me. And where did goodness come from? It comes from God. So, What I'm trying to say is every time I go into a church, and this was the oddest thing, y'all. It was so crazy. Every time I walked into church, they could be talking about Jesus cursing a fig tree, and all of a sudden they'll say something about homosexuals. I'm like, man. And then I go to the next church. You know, it could be about anything. You know, the storm was raging. Oh, homosexuals. There's Mary again, you know. And it's like every church I went in, I was like, come on, man. I'm here trying to get saved. I'm here trying to get my life back with Jesus. You know, quit being afraid of gay people. Quit being scared of them. It's all right. They can get saved. It'll be all right. But I came here. And I prayed when I came here. I said, Lord, please don't let Matt do this too. Please, God, I need a church, man. I just want to go to church somewhere. I want people to leave me alone. Let my sin be dead. Whom the Lord has cleansed is cleansed. And so I came here, and Matt was just about talk, going to talk about homosexuality. And then he said, and if I preach on that, I got to preach on all sin. I got to preach on fornication. And that's what I was, I prayed that's what God would show him. And he literally said it out of his mouth. I told Simi, I said, we found our church. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But that's the truth. But everywhere we went, y'all, I swear, everywhere we went. But I know, and I'm confident, God knew that being gay was no longer a part of my life. I knew that God didn't put that in those people's mouths because I know that God knows that I had repented. I know that God knew that, um, how I'll put it, uh, God knew my past and God wouldn't call me out like that. So I knew that was people's flesh doing that. I knew that was people, people just trying to make it look like it was God to correct me. Okay? God wouldn't call me out like that because God knew. God knew I'd repent it. I mean, good Lord. I ain't even been involved with people for six years. I'm pretty good. I'm good. I'm good, Jesus. And I'm good that way. I'm happy that way. It's all good. No problems here. Uh-huh. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Thank y'all. Again, where am I going with this, Mary? Where are you going with this? God saves sinners. The vilest of sinners. There's many, fa there's many families who have gay children, y'all. They love their kids. You don't think my mom and dad loved me? You don't think it grieved their heart when I went in that direction? My mom, my mom always said, you know, bless her heart, she said, I love you, but I don't agree. You know, but my mom loved me. She prayed for me, y'all. 
And there's people out there with not only gay children, but there's a lot of families who are handling up with divorces. You know? <laughs> there's so many things. Drunkenness, fornications, on and on and on and on. Sin is sin. And the only sin that's not forg forgivable is blasphemy. What I did, yeah, it, according to the Bible, is abomination to God. And yeah, I feel like I disgusted God with my life for that time. But he didn't leave me in a place without repentance. God never left me. He never forsook me. I can't tell you how many times I, I should have died in that time of my life. 20 years of stupidity. I can't tell you how many times I should have died, but I didn't. I even was called an abomination. And I'm not saying this for, for pity. I, I'm, I'm good. I'm, you can call me whatever you want now. But at that time, when I was coming back to God and getting called an abomination, that, that was like, wow. The devil's just got his gun cocked ready for me as soon as I walked in the church. I've had coffee poured on my vehicle in the church parking lot. <laughs> this is for real, y'all. And I understand it. Believe me. I understand it. Because gays in churches are fighting. But those that are fighting, y'all, they'll never like God anyway. I ain't saying they can't be saved, but they're definitely God haters. I, I dealt with a few of those. But the good people... You can, you can save them. You can save them. I promise you, you can. The Bible says to consider ourselves or we will fall into the same temptations. The Bible says also restore such a one when somebody's coming or somebody's falling. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Jesus left 99 to go get one. Amen. The Bible says, don't forget that place where the Lord has taken us from, right? Yeah. Twice the Lord saved me. Twice. God's a God of second chances. Amen. The Bible says that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's no measure of sin that God won't forgive if we turn away and follow Jesus. But I know that wedge. I know that feeling. Even Matt says, I just don't know how to handle it. I don't know how to talk to these people. I'm kind of glad y'all here because y'all maybe can talk to them. And I can. I can talk to every kind of sinner there is because there wasn't much that I didn't do. Except, you know, well, I won't even go there. But there ain't much I didn't do. Put it that way. Not proud of it. I'm just thankful for God's grace, God's mercy, that he brings us back. He doesn't leave us. He don't forsake us. His hand ain't too short that he can't save us. And it doesn't please the Lord. The death of the wicked does not make God happy. It don't make him happy. It grieves his heart the same. It'd be his will. He'd wish everybody would just come. Come, all of you who are burdened, heavy, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Come. That's what Jesus says. He just says, Come. You don't have to stay out there. All right, let me wrap this up. But most people, from what I've experienced, are just everyday normal people that's caught up in some sins. They're without Jesus, they lost. Some of them never heard of Jesus. Maybe had to go through a messed up life before they found Jesus. Many never was raised in church, but their hearts are totally not hardened. I'm trying to help you see that things from a different perspective because, like I said, gay people can be saved. We can't just sit. We can't just call people things and not win them to the Lord. But through repentance and turning away from sin, we all had to do it. 
But first, people got to know that, that there is a way out. There is a way out. And, you know, you got to gain people's trust. You got to show them love some kind of way. You can't just go directly judging people. You got to love them first. And show them that love of Jesus. In Matthew 9, 36, it says, But when he saw the multitudes, y'all look out there, man. There's some lost people out there. Jesus said when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were all scattered. They were like sheep without a shepherd. I almost brought a pot, Matt, (laughs) with a spoon. Because we can have all the gifts. We can heal the sick. We can cast out demons. We can have all wisdom. We can have all knowledge and prophecy and tongues, discerning the spirits. We can have all those gifts. But if we don't function in love, you nothing but a sounding gong, it says. You like somebody walking around beating on the pot. Bing, 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 bing. All y'all sinners, bing, 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 bing. That, that doesn't ever win. And Matt and I probably have come from something like that. I don't know if y'all ever seen that, but the people on the streets holding signs, all drunks are going to hell, all this is going to hell, everybody's going to hell. And it was just like, who's going to be saved? I mean, everybody was going to hell. You know, so... If you walk around with that attitude, beating on the spot, and you ain't got love, love covers a multitude of sin. Love never fails, people. It never fails. I was telling Matt the first time I walked in church, the first time I got saved, I walked in church, and there was a little granny sitting there, and I was spandex pants, tiger stripe, black and red, Muscle shirt, had two different colors in a Pentecostal church. And I walked in, had no idea what Pentecost was, but I heard all these people started praying in tongues. I mean, literally got down and started praying in tongues. And this little old lady, about 90 years old, she said, honey, sit here with me. I sat next to that lady. I don't even know why I started crying, but tears just just ran down my face, and I, was, I cried the whole service just because she was nice to me, because she was kind and sweet, and I felt her love. I felt her genuine love for my soul. And when I left, she said, come back next week, honey. How can you say no? I said, yes, ma'am, I'll be back next week. And that started my life in, in Jesus, just that one little act of kindness. One little act of kindness. One more scripture, Mark 12, 17. When he heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. The world is sick. Sin has caused people to be sick. Sick with sin. I didn't come to call the righteous, but I call come to call sinners to repentance. And believe me, when you love a man, you ain't got to coax them into repenting. They'll do it on their own. By your love, by your care, and like Matt said, obedience to pray for people. To pray as God leads you, you know, as God leads you to pray. Father, I just thank you for this message, Lord. I hope I did it justice, Jesus. I thank you for causing us to be people who love, Lord, that we don't backbite, we don't hurt each other, Lord, because that is so bad. It hurts people so deeply, Lord. Help us to see you in people, Lord. Help us to have your eyes, your heart, your compassion. I thank you for this body, Lord. I believe they love you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you call us out of darkness into your beautiful light. I thank you that there is no sin, Lord, that you cannot forgive. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord. Amen.